Okay, we are recording. Um, and so a uh, few other quick reminders. If you haven't done the post-session survey from last time, please uh, feel free to uh, take advantage of that. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback, especially being a pilot program. It gives us an idea of how to best move forward, gives us suggestions for uh, future sessions or any ways that we can make these sessions better. Um, additionally, I did send out that box.com link a little while back. Um, if you have not received that, uh, please let us know. Um, I'm working on getting the presentations uploaded there as well. So there's been a little technical hiccup. Um, but everything's up there, all the documents uh, from today and other sessions, the uh, presentations, uh, the case presentations, and then uh, the session recordings as well. Um, so uh, with that, um, again, I'm Jevin. I'm the PA with the Survivorship Ship Program. Good morning, Ashley, one of the HEMAP fellows. Good morning, I'm Tara, I'm the director. Hi, good morning, it's Scott, the physical therapist. Good morning, it's Maura, the dietitian. All right, thanks everyone. And um, I just wanted to also say, I hope all of you had a wonderful Thanksgiving and uh, are bright and freshened from uh, the time off and away with your families. So um, we're gonna uh, get started and jump into uh, the case presentation. Um, I do note that I see a few people on, or I see uh, some people on the uh, video as well. Feel free to uh, start your video up so we can see the bright and shining faces this morning. All right, so I'm gonna share the case presentation now, and we'll jump right in. So we're gonna start with uh, Mr. C this morning. Uh, Mr. C is a 70-year-old male. Um, he was diagnosed with uh, salivary duct carcinoma involving the right temporal bone and right parotid gland. Um, he was stage 4B. Um, just jumping down here to his treatment. Um, he had extensive surgery with uh, right intratemporal fossa and parapharyngeal resection, uh, right modified radical neck dissection, and right radical parotidectomy. Um, he had a microvascular left enteral thigh flap facial nerve graft and intramastoid facial nerve to peripheral facial nerve uh, reconstruction as well. He did receive uh, chemotherapy. He had cisplatin for eight weeks concurrent with uh, proton beam radiation um, and had uh, some side effects from that, um, including some uh, tinnitus on the right side, um, trismus, right facial numbness, decreased shoulder range of motion, um, some dysphagia, um, mouth pain, um, and uh, some other symptoms as well. So uh, Mr. C uh, presented to us uh, twice in clinic. Uh, the first time he presented uh, six months from his time of diagnosis, the second time five years out from his time of diagnosis. And we chose this case because it represents um, the changing needs of a survivor over time. And what was unique about this was that he presented specifically at that point where he was five years out from his diagnosis with the thought of what do I do next and where do I go from here now that I'm five years out. Um, the challenges uh, of this case included that the, the um, different concerns that he had for each uh, team member. Um, he, in his first clinic visit, he uh, had concerns of mental strain and anguish um, and loss of nerves in his face, dry eyes, and speech problems. In the second visit, he had complained or had concerns of limited taste sensation and also that he had reached five years and he would you know, go back and forth between feeling relief and feeling wary now that he was five years out. Uh, he lived at home with his wife. Um, he was a retired psychologist. Um, he never smoked and he had one drink of alcohol a day. He was getting 150 minutes or more of exercise each week and he gardened, walked, did yoga and played golf. His pre-diagnosis weight was 155 and he had a significant weight loss post-treatment weight was 140 and current weight coming in it was 148 at the time of the first visit. Um, he did uh, not get five or more servings of fruits and vegetables each day, was not using any vitamins or supplements. He had some other comorbidities uh, with uh, low magnesium, hearing loss, facial palsy, uh, vitiligo, reflux, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, uh, lichen planus, uh, cervical disc disorder, migraines, and total hip replacement in 2011. And 
his only cancer-related family history was in his father, who had an unknown um, cancer. So um, I'm going to take a moment and stop there. I'll stop the share. And I just wanted to check in with all of you and see if you had any questions before we jump into each of our visits uh, with Mr. C. I'm going to go ahead and unmute everyone. Okay, did anyone have any uh, questions or thoughts about this case so far? Hey, this is Lisa from Hampton. I'm surprised that there aren't um, dental or nutritional issues. Hi, Lisa. Um, I'm so sorry. Um, we're having a hard time hearing you. Let's try that one, Mike. That's a lot better. Thank you. Aren't working. I said I'm kind of surprised that there's been no dental or nutritional issues. Just one amount of time yeah, out. there there were um, there just uh, those came out in the visit. It just wasn't included in his intake form um, that he had uh, he had listed on there specifically. So we're going to definitely address those as we're talking a little bit today about our visits. Good thought, though, Lisa. Any any other questions or thoughts about this case so far? Okay, so um, I'm going to mute everyone again. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Maura uh, to start uh, with Mr. C. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, oh, I just want to make a public service announcement. Um, on behalf of dietitians, for um, just to let you know that none of the calories you consumed in Thanksgiving count. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I hope you all enjoy. It. Yeah, yes. <laughs> no, no. No. all that pie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, uh, apple pie is good for you, right? Yeah. It's got fruit. So is pecan pie. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up with three of them, and I enjoyed them all. So, uh, <laughs> so just so you know. Um, yeah, so to Lisa, to your, your, to your um, observation, yeah, uh, this gentleman really presented uh, significant nutrition challenges because of the type of surgery he had, um, just in a, being able to take in enough calories and nutrients to support his um, recovery and his healing from surgery. And this was a motivated guy. And uh, to his credit, he really made an effort, but he was, when he came to me the first time, he was only doing liquid nutrition, you know, meal replacements, Ensure, Scandi shakes, no solid food. And that was for six months. And to his credit, he only lost 10% during his treatment of his body weight. Um, and that just is a, a testament to his commitment because most people with this type of procedure lose a lot more. So he was aware, he was motivated. Um, he had a very supportive wife. So the challenge um, was to, um, from that first visit, transition him from all liquids to um, soft foods that were easy to chew and swallow and moist and could maintain a cohesive bolus when he swallowed and also had flavor and it was real food. So um, they were, he and his wife were ready to do that. And um, I actually, gave them a compilation of 20 recipes that I have just for this purpose. Um, and uh, to kind of, um, and we go through them and we identify what foods they like, but the whole in, intention is that they start um, getting um, all their nutrients from whole foods. And all you have to do is change the texture. So again, I know I bring this up all the time, but that my reliance on the colors but I, even portraying it that way, you need to get all your colors into your day and we just need to modify the texture and then people get it. Um, so things like food processors and immersion blenders come in handy. Um, so um, so we, um, the minimum goal was for this one was 2000 calories a day for him just to maintain his weight. And then if I'll, uh, fast forward five years to the second visit and it, I can't tell you the joy it was to see him and he was so happy to come back to clinic and it really was like a victory lap for him wasn't yeah. it yeah yeah, yeah. he's yeah. like it's five years and you know we all cheered him and so I think he came back to us to kind of celebrate yeah. this five-year mark 
But then it was also like, yeah, I made it. Like, now what? Yeah. I, you know, not to jump in here, but yeah. he wasn't expected to live the past five years. Yeah. Um, he was given, uh, you know, a five-year prognosis at best um, at his time of diagnosis. So when he got to his five-year mark, you're right, half of it was celebration, but half of it was, oh, well, I wasn't supposed to go any further than this. So what am I supposed to do? How am I actually supposed to move forward? Because I'm outliving my expectations. Yeah, so that, um, you know, when he reported that anxiety of, um, you know, celebration, but, it, you know, but, you know, another layer of fear. So, um, so from a nutrition standpoint, um, he had consistently been eating and would have to sustain this modified soft diet. Um, and he was, he stabilized his weight, but now his concerns were dining out because he still had these difficulties uh, swallowing and eating non-customary foods. Like when he was home, he was safe, he was comfortable, he was relaxed, and but going out and eating among friends um, presented a great challenge, and he reported a recent incident where he went to a good friend's house and they served beef, which is one of the hardest things to chew and swallow. And he started, he tried to eat it, and he started coughing, and he made it more anxious. And he ended up vomiting at the friend's house. And he said the friends were sympathetic, but he was very embarrassed. Um, and so we discussed mindful eating practices to reduce the social anxiety in these public settings. Deep breathing before starting to eat, eating slowly, small amounts of food, keeping the food choices moist, and most importantly, giving him permission to decline foods that are offered. Um, and so, um, and his wife was present, and so they they took all of this to heart. And um, so it was interesting to change gears of, well, now I'm out in the world, you know, and but I still, this, this will be a persistent issue for him. So how do I manage it? So I'll pass it on to Scott now. Yeah, so he, uh, when, when I saw him first time, yeah, uh, you know, he was six months out of, out of surgery, um, and, you know, he, he was a pretty active guy as far as, you know, he was trying to get back to golfing, he was trying to get back to walking on a consistent basis, but he definitely presented with some range of motion uh, um, issues with his neck, obviously, with the extensive surgery that he had, um, so, you know, I, I did a, um, a, a range of motion uh, assessment for him and designed a home exercise program for him. And at that time, I said, you know, you need to do this twice a day. You know, you need to think about this like you brush your teeth, right? You brush your teeth every day. So I want you to just to infuse this into your morning routine and to your evening routine, especially when you're in front of a mirror, uh, to get that feedback as far as sort of a rotation and, um, and side bending and, and that sort of thing. It's much easier to do it. Um, if you're right there in front of the mirror, you know, you're, and you got your shaving kit and you got your toothbrush and it just becomes part of your daily routine. The other thing that I had recommended for him, and full disclosure, I am married to a speech therapist. Uh, so I, <laughs> I recommended that he go see a speech therapist to go hand in hand with what Maura was just saying about changing the food textures to make sure that he, you know, could swallow these foods uh, and that he uh, would be able to form a bolus and so that he was actually safe to do that. So to perform a swallowing evaluation uh, and also for him to get that baseline um, because, you know, one of the fears that we run into uh, with radiation therapy is this, you know, concern of radiation fibrosis syndrome down the road. Um, and so, you know, he could have fibrotic changes later on down the road. And so, if you don't have a baseline to go off of, you don't know what you're comparing that to as far as, you know, swallowing ability. Um, so we recommended that he go see a speech therapist, both for the swallow about, but also, again, to try to help with his articulation um, after his surgery. So then now fast forward five years and we see him, and, and like we just said, you know, he had, I think he had just come back from a golfing trip in Ireland <laughs> to celebrate his five year mark, which is fantastic. So again, he's, at, you know, he's active. You know, so from a cardiovascular standpoint, he's, he's doing pretty well. Uh, but he asked me, he said, so I reached my five-year mark. Can I stop doing those exercises that you gave me? And the answer is no. This is a lifestyle change. You know, when we talk about lifestyle changes, you know, you've been hearing us talk about it so often as far as diet and nutrition. But specifically for him, he has to maintain this range of motion um, routine because, again, 
the, the fear of radiation fibrosis syndrome down the road. I don't want anything to, to stiff it up for him. So it really does have to be you know, part of his routine for the rest of his life. Uh, so just being able to reinforce that um, at the five-year mark and saying that this, how important this is for you, uh, for your quality of life moving forward. Uh, so this is Tara, and I'm just going to speak um, a little bit to the first visit because I was, um, I saw him with our former nurse practitioner, May Yawk. And what I remember about this gentleman five years ago now, um, he is a good reminder of that you can't judge a book by its cover because he came in looking very put together. You would not have guessed that he had had neck cancer, um, actually. So he, you know, we see a variety of patients and, and oftentimes, and I'm sure those of you who treat head and neck frequently, you, know, you get a picture in your head of retracted skin and really skinny and, and, you know, on the inpatient unit, they're sometimes using vocorders and this was not that. This man you wouldn't have known. So it's a good reminder that just because somebody looks really good in survivorship doesn't mean they're doing really well. And um, so that was one thing. And the other thing was that he sought us out, which is kind of unusual for a gentleman to do. Most of the time, they're dra dragged in by their wife. Um, and I, I forget now how he was exposed to our clinic, if it was at like a talk or something, but then um, he came in seeking our services. And that was really interesting to me. The things that he was dealing with from the medical standpoint was dry mouth. And we um, had just had like a discussion about acupuncture for xerostomia. And I remember this very specifically because we don't have an acupuncturist here. We still do not, five years later. Um, and we had to like scour the state's registry to figure out who, there's many acupuncturists, but who can do acupuncture for xerostomia. And so he was somebody who we, we didn't have that answer during the visit and we did a lot of legwork, mostly May did a lot of legwork to figure it out and we gave him some names in his region and he went. And so when he came back at that second visit, um, he was very grateful for that. And, and that really stuck out with me and we've since referred many patients to um, acupuncture for xerostomia since him. Um, he's been very active in the complimentary program over the years. So he's a writer and a poet and has read and shared his works in publications and um and i and so we've kind of watched him through the years doing well in general and i didn't get, have a chance to see him at the second visit so jevin will speak about the five-year mark for him yeah thanks tara and um so i did see him uh, again jevin here uh i did see him at the second visit and he was new to me and so um you know sort of to tara's point almost in the first visit but in a different light now that it was five years out he presented as someone who was doing extremely well. And you really wouldn't have known the extensive surgery and the radiation that he went through um, with, uh, you know, with his cancer. And so he was very active, he had changed his lifestyle, he made a lot of changes to better his overall quality of life. Um, and the one thing that continued to persist for him um, relates to his ability to eat certain foods but specifically about his body image. And um, he did bring that up and he cited a story with me of being out one time and um, trying to eat some food and a, a child was guffawing at him. And he didn't really know how to feel about that. And you know, I think partly because he was a retired psychologist and his wife was also um, in the field, um, they, they sort of came to this conclusion together that anything outside of the normal, anybody will, you know, have some reaction to. And so for him, that was really an important tool of reframing his mindset on, on his ability to be comfortable with himself in the public light. And so um, I thought that was really powerful um, when he shared that uh, with me. Um, and so that was, that was fantastic to hear. Um, besides that, uh, he was still struggling uh, a little bit with some of the swallowing concerns he had uh, with food and specifically solid foods. Um, and so he did want to pursue um, speech therapy again um, to help strengthen some of those muscles. And again, as Scott mentioned as well, help with some of the potential radiation fibrosis um, that could set in. 
And so he, uh, we did put in a referral for him. He actually did follow up on that. He's seeing speech therapy now, and he actually went for a modified barium swallow as well. Um, and so uh, it, you know, one thing that's always been great about Mr. C was that um, he's that self-described the most compliant uh, patient you'll ever meet. <laughs> Any recommendation you give him, he, he does it and he does it fast, <laughs> he does it efficiently. So, um, you know, he's, he's ideal in that sense. But um, yeah, so that's, that's our visits uh, with Mr. C. Um, I wanted to stop here and check in with all of you and see if you had any specific questions or um, thoughts. Maybe you've seen someone uh, similar to Mr. C. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute everyone now. And remember too, uh, you can also chime in in the chat box if you're on the computer. Uh, feel free to type in a question and we can open it up for discussion. I, I would just, I was just sort of thinking about all the work that was done to find the acupuncturist and whether or not that was helpful, but, but additionally sort of maybe in the spirit of echo, if that's shared with the whole head and neck dart so that it, you know, this gentleman found you guys, but you know, and that was like really fortunate for him, but whether or not that, gets then, you know, that, you know, really useful piece of information and assistance, you know, is, is sort of shared with everybody so that, you know, there are more people, more patients can really get that benefit. Yeah, that's a great point, Joe. And, um, and yeah, so we, so we have it. If you guys are interested, we can um, look back and, and get you that list. We've also shared it, um, with other head and neck providers and with the complementary services because they see a lot of patients who ask about acupuncture, for instance. Um, I'd be curious to hear from the Hamden group, you know, if, who, if, uh, if that resonates with you, do you recommend acupuncture for your head and neck patients with xerostomia? And, um, you know, in addition to all of this, you know, there's been a strong request for acupuncturists on the main campus. Uh, and so stay tuned about that, see if they hear that request. This is Lisa, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. thanks Lisa. So, so we have done the same kind of research to try to find an acupuncturist because sometimes we're treating more north and so we don't have uh, the same kind of movement of patients don't like to go into New Haven. So we have done some research, but I would certainly love that because patients are interested in using anything. And even if, if the research shows a questionable or small benefit, they're willing to do that if they can afford it, because we find that most patients don't have, uh, it's not part of their insurance coverage. So maybe that's something else to speak to. Um, you know, it, it, this is a, a patient who seems like he was financially well, uh, established, but many of our patients uh, aren't. Mm -hmm. Very true. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, which makes having our own acupuncturist here who knows how to do all of these cancer-related techniques um, and has the ability to offer either a very discounted price or a free service um, even more important. We will find that. We, yeah. It's in the chart from um, five years ago, yeah. and we can send it. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll pull that, I'll upload it on Box, and I can even send it out in the emails to everyone after the session. That'd be great, thanks. No problem. Thank you, Lisa. Great points, Lisa and Joe. Um, anybody else have any thoughts on Mr. C's case? We have time for maybe one more question or comment. Just quickly, the, the, the patient had no dental issues at all, because um, that's another area where we run into um, long-term needs that have to be followed, and it can be challenging um, because patients don't have dental coverage. It, it's something that um, you know was brought up in the follow-up recommendations that he be following up with um, you know 
his dentist. Um, during the visit, um, he didn't specifically speak to uh, any dental needs at the time of his follow-up. Um, and initially, again, it was a lot of the swallowing concerns he had um, that were going on. Yeah, but we've seen, I agree with you. I mean, again, many, many head and neck cancer patients that have come through do have, because I think, you know, right, in addition to the xerostomia, which sets you up for dental issues um, on, ongoing. And, and so that's a common concern. And it's one that's hard to address because again, for the insurance issues and, and um, the way our culture is set up, the dental care is a luxury. So it's, uh, it's hard to know how to counsel a patient about that. I'd be curious to hear any tips from the field. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. I don't know. I don't... How do you guys tell patients, Lisa, how do you approach dental issues? Well, sometimes patients come in with such poor dental care up front that they end up getting full of mouth extractions, <laughs> um, but then that leads into difficulty later with the eating and, and getting dentures, which are not expensive. Um, we have found a couple of, of, of dentists in this area who will be vigilant with patients and provide good prophylactic care. They, they're aware of, of radiation associated side effects, but um, you know we end, we're ending up sending people to the to the hospital-based dental clinic, which can be challenging um, to get patients into. Yeah, we would love so to hear So I have yours. no good suggestions. <laughs> yeah, well, whoever you have that you found to be an ally, we would, we could, um, again, if you could share that with us, we would love to be able to pass that on. Yeah, there are folks up this area, um, so, but I, I do have one or two. You know, the other thing is some practices are constantly merging and changing, so sometimes what was up to date six months ago is not going to work in 2020. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, this is Christian Jethro on the line. I, I describe myself as kind of a stickler about the dental care. And the, the last two head and neck cancer patients I've had, I've made personal phone calls to their dentist before I saw them to get them in right away. And then when I talk with patients, uh, I strongly reinforce my, my thoughts about risks of xerostomia and osteoradionecrosis that are complicated by dental issues. Yeah. The power of communication, right? Just picking up the phone um, can be so helpful to patients. We, don't, we probably don't do that enough. Um, thanks, Christian. And um, thanks, Lisa. I appreciate um, both of those thoughts there. And uh, Lisa, if you could share that um information with us we'd be happy to pass that along to the group and um, that would be very useful even for us um thank you and yes christian um i, I agree and definitely uh in clinic whenever we have um if you prefer or something like that um you know i think it's important to one share share the note with uh the other providers and then two uh follow up with them and and try to get them in uh expediently as well so I definitely agree with that philosophy. I was in our clinical huddle, but I caught the end of what you were describing where the patient was concerned about eating in public because of the view of a child who was watching him. I, th yes. I think that's a pretty big issue that's not well captured. Um, the RTOG has a performance data scale. It's a public eating performance scale. And the questions in, that are included are, do you have any restrictions in places that you eat? Now, I've asked patients, are there foods that you avoid? And they'll say, no, I eat it all. But then I'll ask him, where do you eat? And many will say, I never eat out of the home because I'm scared of people watching me eat. Right. Which isn't consistent with, you know, they don't feel like they have limitations in food, but they're scared of people watching them. And that's a pretty big impact. Yep. It's not well captured, I, I don't think, in our clinical visits. And it affects the whole family, right? Because then yeah. the spouse doesn't go or goes alone and or the you know they're they're not meeting their brothers and sisters and their friends and so it leads to a lot of social isolation definitely yeah, that's a great point and i think in you know in in our case here with mr c you know he he was able to develop this coping mechanism that worked for him um but not everyone has has that sort of ability or 
um, you know, thought to be able to come up with something like that on their own. So I think if we can help foster that, um, that's important. All right. Um, so thank you everyone for, for the, the great uh, points and um, you know, discussion on uh, Mr. C's case. I think um, we're gonna jump into the uh, presentation for today on some of the late effects uh, from treatment. So I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen. I'm gonna make sure everyone is muted again as well. Okay. All right, so uh, we're gonna be talking about some late effects from treatment, uh, starting out with peripheral neuropathy, moving to lymphedema and then fear of food. Again, unfortunately, um, uh, Angela, our social worker, is not here today, um, so uh, we're going to address those three topics. So, uh, peripheral neuropathy um, is defined as nerve-related pain, numbness, uh, tingling, and also other uh, symptoms that can come from it can include swelling, cold sensitivity, and or muscle weakness or cramps. Um, what happens is, uh, again, peripheral ner nerves help to transmit um, signals from the brain and the central nervous system um, to the rest of the body. And uh, specifically, uh, peripheral neuropathy induced from chemotherapy um, is often length dependent. And so you see this stocking glove distribution where the axons coming from the nerve cell bodies are damaged, um, be it from the chemotherapy itself. Um, or uh, some other potential causes in other cases of peripheral neuropathy. And um, this results in those issues with um, proprioception, vibration, light touch, uh, potentially pain, and temperature for the small myelinated axons, um, and for the, excuse me, the large uh, myelinated axons, and small myelinated axons can affect pain and temperature. Um, and again, uh, heart, you know, going back to our original presentation, talking about how uh, prevalent this is in the survivor population, um, it can range from anywhere between 19 and 85 percent of people who experience this, dependent upon the treatment received. And I'll get into that in just a moment. Um, that ranges from you know those who experience it acutely, subacutely, and chronically as a long-term effect. And uh, you know, here it's important to mention that this can lead to a permanent symptom and disability in up to 40% of cancer survivors. Unfortunately, um, you know, chemo, uh, chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy is not um, a curable um, symptom um, or side effect, but it, it is treatable and it can be well managed to the point where, um, you know, people are not experiencing sensory or motor loss as a result of it. Um, specifically, you can uh, look into this with uh, nerve conduction uh, studies, uh, which measure the speed of transmission of uh, the nerve's uh, impulse and signal. Um, whereas also an electromyography can help record electrical activity from the muscles and help determine if this is related to a motor neuropathy versus other nerve and muscle disorders. Um, Talking a little bit now about some of the causes for peripheral neuropathy, um, this can actually also be radiation induced as well for radiation therapy. Um, while the mechanism is not well understood, it can be related to vascular injury, radiation fibrosis, and nerve compression. Um, the part that I'm going to focus on a little bit more today is the chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy. And there are a number of potential agents that can cause it, including platinum based agents such as cisplatin, carboplatin. Um, and oxaloplatin, um, vinca alkaloids as well, um, and christine, and blastine, uh, epothalones such as uh, exabepilone, um, taxanes like paclitaxel, docetaxel, and nabpaclitaxel, um, proteasome inhibitors such as bortezomib, and immunomodulatory drugs like thalidomide for multiple myeloma. Um, Certain agents like uh, the paclitaxel, for example, um, and the oxaloplatin um, can cause symptoms uh, sh during or shortly after treatment as well. And cold sensitivity in particular can be a hallmark with oxaloplatin. Um, this will often improve over time after completion of treatment. 
um, decreasing the percentage of symptoms seen um, in patients by about from one to six months um, out from treatment. And there are a number of cancers that these treatments can be associated with, things like breast cancer, colorectal cancer, um, lung cancer, uh, multiple myeloma, and gastric cancer as well. Um, there are a number of other causes, uh, and you want to consider these, of course, in the risk assessments uh, being done. Uh, physical injury, of course, uh, to the nerves, diabetes with diabetic neuropathy happening in about 60 to 70 percent of those with uh, diabetes. Uh, vascular conditions leading to poor blood supply in the nerves. Autoimmune disorders like the Embry syndrome, um, Sjogren's, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, cancer related pain, of course, with mass effect uh, can cause nerve damage, uh, and that can be through immune attack on the cancer as well. Uh, infection like herpes zoster with shingles, West Nile virus, cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex, and Lyme disease. It's always important to consider um, opportunistic infections in uh, people with uh, things like uh, immunodeficiency or HIV. Um, and then uh, rarely uh, genetic etiologies as well, uh, like with charcot marie tooth, which directly causes uh, peripheral nerve damage uh, and will usually present as well with muscle mass loss and um, other signs. And Oh, so I'll, I'll, yeah, so John and I got a tag team on this one. Uh, so when, we, when it comes to assessing peripheral neuropathy, uh, there's a variety of different ways that we can do it. Um, there are a couple of subjective questionnaires that are out there uh, to get the patient's perspective um, on how the peripheral neuropathy is impacting their quality of life. Um, you know, in the, in the rehab clinic, in the physical therapy clinic, we can take a little more time and actually use the Sem Weinstein filaments to actually go through each um, pressure point um, and um, can determine the extent of the uh, peripheral neuropathy. Um, but, um, you know, out in the field, if you're trying to do something really quick and easy to try to get a, a kind of uh, objective measurement on peripheral neuropathy, one of the things that you can do, and this has actually been um, validated, is using a tuning fork. You strike, you have the patient close their eyes, you strike the tuning fork, and you put it on their, um, on their wrist, and you put it on their ankle. And if they tell you that it stops vibrating before it actually stops vibrating, that means they have decreased sensation. So you don't have to go through the entire Sem Weinstein you know, filament assessment. We can do that in the, um, in the rehab clinic, but if you've got to do it uh, quickly in your clinic, uh, the tuning fork is a quick way to do it. Um, again, in the, in the rehab clinic, we can take a little more time to really um, see how this is affecting this person's quality of life. Uh, the occupational therapist will use like a pegboard or a functional dexterity test. Um, and for, for me, um, obviously, one of my big concerns is if anybody has neuropathy in their feet, that becomes a balance issue. Um, is, this a, is this person at an increased risk of falls if they don't know where their feet are? Um, so I'll go through a, a comprehensive balance assessment with them as well. Thanks, Scott. And um, so this is Jevin again. I'm uh, going to be going back to uh, some treatment options now. Um, so the first uh, thing that I think about is uh, protection and considering the impact on a person's quality of life. So it's important to be um, keeping uh, the extremities warm, uh, think, thinking about things like cold sensitivity, as well as uh, being able to check for any um, you know, cuts or abrasions on the assessment. Um, and counseling on uh, people being able to do that in their morning routine, for example, or maybe when they get ready in the morning um, or at night. Um, because if they're having numbness, say, for example, on the bottom of their feet, and like in this picture here, they're walking on rocks or something like that, they might not notice um, that they have a new cut on their foot, foot can lead to infection and so on, ulceration. Um, and so it's important for these people to be checking, um, you know, their feet, their hands regularly, making sure they're clean, they're protected, um, and there's uh, no uh, cuts or abrasions. Um, and this also would help with mobility as well. Um, other uh, thoughts I have about treatment. Um, the B vitamins can also help with peripheral neuropathy, specifically thinking about B6 um, with 100 milligrams a day and B12, 1,000 micrograms a day. Um, specifically, the B vitamins uh, help because they participate as uh, cofactors um, or coenzymes in uh, neurotransmitter synthesis. 
Um, so they help to continue to stimulate um, good uh, neural health as well. And additionally, with treatment, um, you can sometimes see B12 deficiencies. So that's something else to be on the lookout for as well. Um, the anticonvulsants have also been showed, shown um, to be effective in treating nerve-related pain, such as gabapentin and pregabalin. Uh, the tricyclic uh, antidepressants, nortriptyline and amitriptyline. Um, SNRIs with duloxetine and venlafaxine. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Um, acupuncture and other complementary therapy options have also been um, shown in some smaller studies um, to be beneficial, specifically thinking about acupuncture here. Um, patients have reported improved symptom relief from this. Um, however, uh, these studies have been small. Um, there need to be more uh, larger studies to, to show the uh, efficacy behind this, as well as com comparison to sham acupuncture as well. Um, and then uh, going to uh, what Scott's going to be talking about in a moment here, physical activity and um, different exercises that can help resensitize and re-innervate some of those nerves and that nerve damage. Um, I want to make a point quickly about duloxetine. Um, specifically, uh, duloxetine uh, is recommended by ASCO, um, and use of other options are not specifically recommended. So that's something that we consider um, as a first-line option for uh, nerve-related pain from peripheral neuropathy. Can I make one comment about prevention? You know, the <clears throat> there's been a a long-standing practice of holding a bag of peas, for instance, in the effort during chemotherapy to decrease the blood supply to the periphery and, de and thereby decrease neuropathy. And you know, now there are companies that make like cold gloves and cold booties. And we're thinking about um, offering that here at Smilo. I think there has been a donor who's um, donated gloves and booties. And I've heard commentary recently um, by Hope Rugo at UCSF that, you know, the proximity to the skin, it has to be really close. So the, the gloves and booties are probably going to be more effective than like holding a, a cold bag of peas, although that's something that um, many patients have easier access to. So just a comment on that. And, and personally, I don't know how much I've seen it help, um, but I'd be curious to hear if other people have patients who have done that. Thanks, Tara. Yeah, and I know we're short on time, so we can just keep moving on. Yeah, uh, so I won't, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, I would just uh, point out, you know, if, if you have a patient who's got peripheral neuropathy, especially if they have it in their feet, you know, you can always make a rehab referral, um, you know, so we can screen out for, for those balance uh, assessments, and we can design a home exercise program um, and truly address uh, balance in the clinic. Um, you know, um, if you're if you've got one thing that you need to impress upon your patient as far as exercise is concerned, um, that you may want to, especially if they have neuropathy in their feet, you may want to skew them towards something like an exercise bike uh, versus like walking on a treadmill, uh, just from a safety uh, perspective. Um, but again, we'll uh, we can put together a, a full um, program that combines cardiovascular exercise, strength training, and some of these sensitization. Uh, exercises to help with neuropathy. So from there, I'm going to jump quickly into uh, lymphedema. Uh, full disclosure, I am not lymphedema certified, uh, but I have colleagues who are, um, and uh, I have the luxury of, of working with alongside them. Uh, so I won't go too deep into this. Um, if you ever have a patient that you feel has lymphedema or you want um, a lymphedema assessment, we do have um, PTs and OTs um, throughout our, our care network that, um, that you can refer to. Um, but as far as what you can impress upon your patients, as far as surveillance is concerned for, um, for lymphedema, um, these are some of the questions that you want to ask um, as far as if you notice any swelling in your arms and uh, chest or breast. Um, and really, you know, asking your patients, you know, do your rings feel tight? Does your watch feel tight? Those types of things. Um, you know, and you, you need to be cued into words that they may use, such as heaviness, tiredness, tingling, or weird. Uh, again, our, our certified lymphedema therapist can go through a, a very specific uh, objective assessment uh, for neuropathy. Um, just sitting back, I can tell you that even, um, you know, 
know, within the, the lymph edema world, even they kind of talk about, you know, do we measure every four centimeters? Do we measure every 10 centimeters? But there are some objective things that we use, like the barometer. Um, we now have the SOZO uh, at the main campus. Uh, Lee Friedman loves using that piece of equipment for uh, objective measurement of upper extremity and lower extremity lymphedema. So again, you know, when all else fails, if you have any questions, if your patients have any questions about lymphedema, uh, the bottom line is to have them refer to a certified lymphedema therapist. Um, I threw these slides up here because I know that there's a lot of um, questions and misinformation out there about, you know, how do you prevent lymphedema? Um, you know, the, the classic questions about air travel and, and lifting and blood pressure cuffs and all that sort of thing. And so interestingly enough, the, the National Lymphedema Network has these next two slides up on their website. Um, but it's interesting that uh, a recent survey of 900 breast cancer survivors said that um, over 90% of them have been advised on these particular guidelines and over 90% of them have tried to comply with them, but it's hard. It's hard for patients to try to be perfect and it actually can cause some anxiety uh, as far as, oh no, don't do blood pressure on this arm or, or you know, you can't take blood out of, out of this arm. And so, um, as uh, I would actually skip ahead one more, um, you know, to tell you that um, really the, the true side effects or the true um, things that could cause um, uh, lymphedema are actually uh, weight um, and cellulitis. And so those are really the two things that we try to um, tell patients that they have control over as far as good skin care um, and maintaining a healthy body weight. Um, the rest of those things you know, again, as far as air travel um, and blood pressure cuffs, there actually is not um, a whole lot of scientific evidence out there proving or disproving it either way. Um, so we actually need more research as to what is uh, best standard of practice. Um, and so I think that we can uh, we can tell our patients that yes, you know, you you want to take all the precautions necessary, um, but if you have one blood pressure done on that affected arm, don't feel that you're automatically going to get lymphedema because we don't actually have the research to back that up. Um, I will say though that, um, and you probably all know about this study, but it, um, the proof is just pointing out quickly that, um, you know, that um, controlled systematic uh, strength training um, for patients who are at risk for lymphedema uh, is actually safe. Um, and we want our patients who may be at risk for lymphedema to actually move their arm. Um, and so again, you know, the, 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 the study that came out in 2010 with um, uh, Dr. Smith and, uh, and her team, I was really groundbreaking because prior to that, we told our patients, don't lift more than five pounds. Um, don't lift a gallon of milk, don't pick your kid up kind of a thing. And, and now we know that as long as it's done systematically and it's done routinely, um, through um, starting with low resistance and increasing our reps, um, you know, and trying to keep our patients away from kind of the more holistic motions like CrossFit and that kind of stuff, um, that, uh, that we, we have found that um, it's, it's actually a good thing to have our breast cancer survivors um, and anybody at risk for lymphedema do some sort of strength training. Well, I don't know, in the interest of time, do you want to open up for conversation? Because there was a lot of great stuff about um, peripheral neuropathy and lymphedema. I just want to throw in uh, a little advertisement for the lean study in that we incorporated that progressive strength training in the current lean study for the women who are diagnosed with breast cancer at the time of diagnosis. So we send a set of dumbbells to their home, three pounds, five pounds, eight pounds. We have an online video they follow. We have a hard copy book, and part of our um, lifestyle intervention is um, mapping out a progressive strength training program for them, one to maintain lean body mass, but also for prevention of lymphedema. Okay, well, thanks everyone so far. Um, I wanted to open up too, uh, and I'm gonna unmute everyone. Uh, sorry about that. Um, if you guys have any thoughts or questions, um, any other topics so far? Feel free to let us know. You can enter into the chat box as well. Thank you. 
Or we could finish up with the fear of food then sure. if you want if you'd rather. Okay, we'll, uh, why don't we uh, finish up? Finish up, we'll do a quick. Sure. So the um, purpose here was to talk about unique late effects in each of our disciplines. And, um, and in nutrition, um, the slide I have up there is one, just to describe what we call, this is, uh, if you want to know how dietitians look at you when we see, you, this is really how we see you. Uh, you know, just looking at you as a digestive tract. Um, so that's how I look at a patient when I see them. And we call, um, the, in the late effects of treatment, we, we look at those um, um, effects that impact their ability, uh, their nutritional steps, their ability to eat, swallow, consume adequate nutrition, and, and also to absorb nutrients. So um, this is just the laundry list of um, what, we, what presents to us as obstacles to promote good nutrition. So if we go to the next slide, these are my um, com most commonly used therapeutic diets in the clinic. Um, number one is really texture modifications for chewing and swallowing difficulties. Um, a diet for GERD to manage gastric reflux. I can't tell you how common that is. Um, and also the, the powerful use of fiber for bowel health and the difference, um, the, uh, the different types of fiber that can manage different um, conditions of constipation and diarrhea. This is not well known. And uh, this is a really powerful management tool of um, showing people the different food sources for insoluble versus soluble fiber and how that makes a difference in managing uh, constipation and diarrhea. Um, and again, these are all built into the lean protocol, uh, just so you know, uh, but that's very common, people find that very helpful. And also the use of, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this FODMAP diet, which is one of those things you're grateful it has an acronym because you can see what it stands for. And um, fermentable oligo dye monosaccharides and polyols. And these are short chain fatty, uh, short chain carbohydrates. And um, often there's a difficulty um, absorbing these. So people who have um, like IBS symptoms or um, you know, very varying complaints of um, absorption and pain. Doing this kind of elimination diet is very helpful. Um, and it was originated out of um, Monash University in Australia. It's getting a lot of traction. Now, the next um, kind of unique thing I just want to point out is people can develop actually a fear of food because they say something I ate must have caused my cancer and something I will eat will cause my cancer to return. Now, this is, a, this is different from what we were talking about earlier in the case study where there was a fear of eating out. Now that's, you know, but you saw how socially isolating it could be. But this is different. This is like people actually staying away and starting eliminating uh, the, uh, whole classes of foods to the point where they uh, have a, a very uh, insufficient diet. And it's all based about fear. And my challenge is to turn it into enjoyment. And the, a lot of this comes from, and I've used this slide before, is just the um, vast amount of misinformation and confusion that's out there when people start figuring out, why did this happen to me? And to take it a step further, a lot of it's the confused messaging they get from their healthcare teams. And so one of my missions uh, is to try to get consistent messaging among the teams. All right. Well, thanks everyone for speaking a little bit about some of the different late effects today. And thank you all for taking the time to listen, try to share a little different scene, get in the spirit of uh, winter here. Uh, this picture from New Haven. Um, all right. So I'm going to open the floor up again one more time. Um, we're a little short in time. We have a few minutes left. Um, sorry about that. Uh, if you have any questions or um, thoughts about any of the topics, feel free to uh, jump in. It's Lisa. I just want to quickly say that in the head and neck patients, lymphedema involving the neck and the mouth area can actually contribute to eating problems. And we've had people have dental problems that are worsened by lymphedema involving the oral, you know, oral cavity. So um, breast is the place that we think about the most, but um, great presentation, and this was really helpful today. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a very, very good point, um, and, and you're right. Again, our, 
our lymphedema therapists do see that. They see lymphedema, you know, in the, in the head and neck population. We see it um, in the ovarian cancer population. They see lymphedema in the, the lower extremities. Um, and so really, I mean, no, you know, there's very few cancers that we can say that they're, that they're, that there's not some risk uh, of that. So that's a very good point. Thank you. There's new techniques being developed too with lymph node transfer surgery that, you know, I think have yet to demonstrate sustainable progress, but hopefully this will continue to be developed so we can have something The one you should get me over. I'm like, okay, where do I get this one again? How do I do Great it? Thought, okay. Lisa. And um, anybody else have any other thoughts on any of the topics or questions? Maybe a case you've seen related yeah. to one of these awesome. topics? Okay, so we have just about a minute left, but I did want to ask everyone um, if there are any uh, topics, any, um, you know, areas that we did maybe didn't discuss and cover in these first five sessions. We have one session left, and part of our last session, uh, we wanted to have sort of an open forum for that and, and give you a chance to give, um, you know, feedback or ask about uh, questions related to survivorship care that maybe um, were on your mind that we hadn't addressed yet. Um, anything that anyone has uh, thoughts on now? Uh, resources for sexual function for males. Okay, that is a great topic. Uh, we will definitely bring that to the table um, for the last session as well, since we're running just a little bit low on time right now. Gemma, maybe we can ask a guest speaker to come we that would address sexual health. Um, yeah. I have a few people in mind. Okay. See if they're available. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, um, so uh, we're just about uh, at the uh, nine o'clock mark here. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I will send out the post-session survey for everyone. If you have any thoughts, questions, comments, anything you couldn't get out today, feel free to put it on that survey, send it back to us, let us know how we're doing as well. Um, and then I'll put everything up on box.com. And until next time, we'll see you back in two weeks on uh, December 20th, uh, same bad time, same bad channel, okay? All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Bye, guys.